Well, it looks like it's uh, 1030, about time to get rolling. It's the uh, September installment of uh, Wild Science. Uh, we've got a couple of good ones today, I think. Uh, uh, first up, we're going to have uh, Jeremy Risley, who's been with the AGFC for 16 years. Uh, he's a district supervisor in the fisheries division. He's worked all over the state. He holds a uh, master's degree in biology from uh, Missouri State and a bachelor's in fisheries and wildlife biology from Arkansas Tech. Uh, his presentation today is, is called uh, Consequences of Summer Kills on Management of Striped Bass in Norfolk Lake. That's a mouthful, Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you're ready to, uh, to take over the screen, it's all yours, buddy. All right. Okay, am I show is my presentation showing? Uh yes, it appears to be. Okay. Okay. So hey, well, one thing, Jeremy, before we start, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um we'll have uh time for questions after the, after Jeremy's presentation and after the one from Rob. So uh please hold your questions. I'm sorry, right. go ahead. No problem. Okay, so um, thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, before I get started, I want to acknowledge some of the other researchers uh, on this project. Paul Port and Cody White are both biologists in District 2, and Alex Bazell, uh, Dr. Quentin Phelps, and Hey Kim with uh, Missouri State University also helped on this project. So let's get to the presentation. Norfolk Lake is nearly a 22,000 acre U.S. Army Corps of Engineer Highland Flood Control Reservoir located in Northern Arkansas and Southern Missouri. It was founded in 1944 and was the third reservoir completed by the Arkansas, I mean, by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Norfolk Lake primary production is generally characterized as oligometrophic, meaning it's uh, moderately unproductive. Norfolk has a 26 foot flood pool with a water level fluctuation of 19 feet annually and can uh, fluctuate as much as 40 feet in any given year. Striped bass are native to the Atlantic and Gulf Coast where they spend their adult lives in salt water but spawn in fresh water. In 1941, biologists discovered striped bass could survive solely in fresh water when a population of striped bass became landlocked with the construction of the Santee Cooper Reservoir uh, in South Carolina. With, the knowledge, with this knowledge, the game and fish began stocking striped bass in the late 1950s to occupy open water habitats, control large gizzard chad, while also providing a trophy fishery and large reservoirs around the state. However, it wasn't until the late 1960s that the commission introduced striped bass to Norfolk Lake. And like other striped bass reservoir fisheries in the state, striped bass cannot naturally reproduce in Norfolk. Thus, they, thus hatchery reared fish are stocked to maintain the fishery. In 1988, biologists began requesting striped bass be stocked annually into Norfolk. However, the numbers varied greatly from year to year. It wasn't until the approval of the striped bass species management plan in 2003 that bio biologists began requesting 154,000 striped bass be stocked annually into Norfolk Lake. Now striped bass are one of the most targeted species on Norfolk Lake behind black bass and crappie. We manage the striped bass population as a trophy fishery with a 20 inch minimal link limit and a three fish daily krill. This fishery, is rec it, this fishery is recreationally and economically important to the local community and partners like the Lake Norfolk Striper Club and the Lake Norfolk Chamber of Commerce. Now, a couple of life history aspects that must be considered when managing striped bass on Norfolk Lake. Striped bass cannot tolerate high water temperatures and low dissolved oxygen levels. So research has shown that adult striped bass can become stressed and die in water temperatures above 77 degrees and dissolved oxygen levels below two parts per million. 
These factors can strongly influence where adult striped bass reside on Norfolk Lake. For example, adult striped bass seek thermal refuge in the cool oxygenated water near the Norfolk Dam during the summer months. And this area is highlighted in the white on the map of Norfolk Lake. Now this graph shows an example of dissolved oxygen and temperature data collected from the Norfolk Lake Dam in mid-August. The solid line is dissolved oxygen and the dashed line is the temperature data. These measurements increase as you move right on the X, y, X axis and the water temperature depth, I mean, I'm sorry, the water depth increases as you move down the X, y, X, X, or I'm sorry, the Y axis. So as you move to the right, the uh, dissolved oxygen temperature increases, and as you move down, the depth of water increases. For this example, the water temperature down to approximately 35 feet was too warm for adult striped bass to inhabit without being stressed, forcing them to seek thermal refuge in deeper water. This will be the only time that I show temperature data as temperatures vary little when the striped bass are in thermal refuge. As for dissolved oxygen, you can see that the deeper water contains enough dissolved oxygen for striped bass to survive. And for the rest of the presentation, I will be focusing on that area of Norfolk Lake. So you can see when I remove the temperature data, the oxygen and you, you can see the oxygen in deep water better. This isolated area is called the hypolinetic oxygen maximum. And it's typically located somewhere between 80 and 130 feet on Norfolk Lake. For the rest of this presentation, I will refer to this area as the bubble. When in the bubble, the striped bass are essentially trapped due to a little dissolved oxygen above and below this area. The literature has shown that when striped bass inhabit the bubble, they choose comfort over food, which potentially leads to malnutrition. Now the picture to the top left shows striped bass inhabiting the bubble on Norfolk Lake. You can see that the striped bass are located from 80 to 100 feet of water in this image and are isolated from other fish species, which can be seen at 20 to 30 feet of water. Now, the lower right image shows an emaciated striped bass that was collected on Norfolk Lake, which supports the notion that limited foraging opportunities occur in the bubble. Now, when the lake is at or below conservation pool, the striped bass can survive in the bubble until sometime in September when they begin to disperse to other areas of the lake. Where we start to have issues is during high water years. Now, when I refer to a high water year, I'm referring to years when water levels rises, rise into the flood pool in the spring and stay there until at least September. For example, this hydrograph shows the 2017 high water year on Norfolk Lake. You can see the water level entered the flood pool in April and stayed there until October. Now, these high water years have, beca became, or have become quite common since 2010. High water years have occurred in 2011, 15, 17, 19, 2020, and this year. In fact, the same number of high water events have happened in the past 11 years as the 65 years beforehand going back to impoundment. Now, increased organic matter and primary production results in greater biological demand during these high water years. These influences combined with hydrological factors such as increased outflow and the low, uh, to lower the lake level can significantly decrease the dissolved oxygen in the bubble on North Fork Lake. This, reduce, this reduction in dissolved oxygen uh, results in a striped bass summer kill. And it should be noted that these kills do not occur on the other striped bass fisheries in the state. And with that said, I will use the 2019 dissolved oxygen data to show the bubble dissolving over time. The right dotted line represents the dissolved oxygen collected on August 21st. You can see by September 8th, the middle dash line, the bubble has significantly decreased. And when the maximum dissolved oxygen levels drop to this level, we typically begin collecting the most dead and dying striped bass. Now by September 16th, 
the solid left line, the dissolved oxygen dropped to a level that virtually no adult striped bass could survive. Now, striped bass summer kills on Norfolk Lake were documented in 2002, 4, 2011, 15, 17, 19, and 2020. During the last four kills, we've made it a concerted effort to pick up as many dead and dying striped bass as possible in order to collect valuable biological data instead of instead of letting them go to waste. We took measurements and odorless for most of the striped bass collected for aging purposes. During these four kills, we collected from 25 to 877 fish, and sizes ranged from 18 to 43 inches, with the average size being around 27 inches. While we observed a full range of adult striped bass during these kills, the larger fish were impacted first. And as the kills progressed, the size of fish collected decreased. We observed few juveniles in these kills, as they are likely inhabiting shallow areas of Norfolk Lake. Unfortunately, we have some issues assessing with how many striped bass die during these events. First, we don't know how many striped bass are actually occupying the bubble when the summer kill occurs. Second, we are unable to determine what percentage of the dead and dying stripers come to the surface. Finally, due to the warm water, or the warm water uh, at the surface, some striped bass decompose to the point that we cannot collect them in time. While we can determine how many striped bass die in these striped bass kills, we can use statistical models to predict the impact of the summer kills on the striped bass population in Norfolk Lake. And this is what Alex, Quinton, and Hay with Missouri State have been working hard on. They have used data derived from these summer kills and a yield per recruit model. They constrained the model to only striped bass 10 inches and greater. The model predicted that overall striped bass population in Norfolk Lake could decline if 25% of the population died during one of these summer kills. The model also suggested that 30% that of the striped bass population dying during a kill could cause a 50% reduction in the number of 20 inch and greater striped bass in Norfolk Lake. Now here comes the scary part of, this, uh, of these kills. The model predicted that if 10% of the striped bass population died in a kill, could result in a 50% reduction in the number of trophy-sized striped bass in Norfolk Lake. In conclusion, there's still more that we can learn about the consequences of the summer kills on striped bass population in Norfolk Lake. However, the model suggests that even low-intensity summer kills could have an effect on the striped bass population in Norfolk Lake. Unfortunately, if the frequency of summer kills continues into the future, there will come a point where shifts in management strategies may be necessary. And if we were to reach this point, the efforts that we're making now to understand the impacts of those summer kills will pay huge dividends at that time. And with that, I will uh, take any questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, does anyone have any questions for, for Jeremy? Uh, Randy, you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, I was curious, Jeremy, can you explain uh, maybe a little bit why it's only happening on um, uh, Norfolk and not Washita and Beaver and some of the others? Is there a reason for that? Uh, at this time, we are unaware exactly why. Uh, that, that, that's one of the questions that we're hoping to address at some point in the future is trying to figure out why only Norfolk is impacted uh, uh, with these summer kills and why we don't see the bubble collapsing uh, on these other reservoirs. Now, one uh, explanation could be that uh, on Washita and Beaver, the, the water level doesn't fluctuate as high and stay as high as long as it does on Norfolk. So maybe the, these hydro, hydrological factors are, 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 are a bigger factor in Norfolk than on Beaver and Washita. Okay, uh, anybody else? 
I had one thing, uh, Jeremy, that's that you may not be able to answer, and it's, it's kind of kind of an odd question, but I think you mentioned 150 some thousand fingerlings back in 2003. How did how did they arrive at that number? Uh, I'm not for sure. I think it was a goal to to stock the the same fish per acre as beaver and Washita at the time. So they, uh, that that comes out to seven fish per acre. Uh, so we also stock seven fish per acre in Beaver Lake uh, as well. And so it, it, it's more of just trying to keep the number per acre being the same amongst the, the reservoirs. Makes sense. Uh, anyone else have anything for Jeremy? Thank you. Okay, man. Um, next up is Rob Willie. Rob's another veteran of the uh, Game and Fish Commission. He's a wildlife habitat coordinator. He's been with the AGFC since 1999. He's got a bachelor's degree in biology and wildlife management from Arkansas State. He's also a certified wildlife biologist with the Wildlife Society and a registered forester with the Arkansas Board of Registered Foresters. His presentation today is restoration and management of oak woodlands and glades within the Ozark Highlands. So, Rob, if you're ready to go, it's all yours. I think he's getting there. How about now? Uh, we can see your presentation, but you're not full screen. Sorry about that. This is the, uh, the hardest part. We're open to advice, by the way. <laughs> Rob, I think if you go back to your PowerPoint um, and just click on the that slide button down there in the lower right, I think you'll get it. That slideshow right to the left of that. Yes. How about now? Yeah, we see your presentation with the notes on the side. I think this. Yeah. This is why we did the practice run Friday. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Dress rehearsal was perfect. I, I don't understand. Don't understand. I, uh, I know this is typical. All right, Chris, what do I need to do? <laughs> um, go ahead and unshare your screen. <laughs> All right, now share again. Let's see if you can pick out your um, PowerPoint to share. about now now try putting it back in that full um, slide screen I think this is okay I mean we see your notes on there um, but we do see the full screen of your presentation so I think you're okay now okay Sorry about that, everybody. That was uh, quite uh, traumatic for me. That's okay. <laughs> well, good morning. Um, I'm going to be talking about restoration management of oak woodlands and glades within the uh, Ozark Islands. And um, I'm going to start with a uh, high-level view of the Ozark Islands and then bring it down to a um, WMA level where we're going to talk about restoration and management. 
So the Ozark Islands, they cover approximately 26 million acres in Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Kansas, with the Arkansas portion of the highlands uh, consisting of approximately 4.8 million acres. And they are divided into four subsections. And uh, when we bring it to the wildlife management area level, we're going to be looking at the Central Plateau primarily. All right, current forest conditions of this ecoregion, it uh, bears little to no resemblance of historic conditions. Um, General Land Office survey notes from the early 1800s document open, broken woodlands and barrens, uh, grasslands, uh, and, and very lush uh, uh, understory uh, with a, uh, a significant shrub layer. It was not a uh, um, heavily forested area due to the history of fire on the landscape. And there have been um, numerous uh, research projects uh, to uh, um, back this up uh, over, over the years. And um, Northern Arkansas, the, uh, um, based on the physical chemistry of uh, climate, uh, they estimated that the uh, fire return interval was really every six to eight years. And uh, another uh, project where fire severity and frequency was uh, linked to vegetation type uh, was really at zero to 10 years with uh, the more grass, you know, grassy understory uh, receiving uh, um, uh, a tighter return interval for fire. And uh, these uh, historic fires were both lightning strike uh, set fires and of uh, uh, fires set by Native Americans. Okay, now bring it down to the wildlife management area level. I'm going to focus primarily on three uh, uh, terrestrial habitat types uh, that are uh, make up the majority of this WMA and really represent what the historic conditions of uh, this eco, eco region was uh, pre settlement. Um, the first uh, um, one is going to be the Ozark Washita dry oak woodland. Um, this uh, habitat type. Uh, occurs primarily on southerly and westerly aspects and um, is characterized by shallow, shallow soils with calcareous to acidic parent material. Uh, the dominant uh, um, uh, forest species is going to be post oak, blackjack, and chinkapin oak, all of which are fire, more fire tolerant uh, species. Um, understory composition will resemble native uh, grassland prairies and have a significant shrub uh, component to it. Uh, drought, stress, and, and fire are the primary uh, influences, uh, influencing process for this system to, to maintain the diverse uh, 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 species composition and open forest structure. The second uh, habitat type is going to be the Ozark Washita Dry Mystic Oak Forest Woodland. And this occurs on dry to sites with uh, a limited, a little bit more moisture than what the dry oak woodlands will have. Um, the soils are moderately to well drained and more fertile than what uh, would be associated with the dry oak woodlands. Um, an open to closed canopy of uh, oak species of northern red oak and white oak uh, with a hickory component uh, are typical in this system. So it's a, a little bit uh, wetter side, a little bit more fertile site. Um, it's uh, there's going to be there's going to be uh, the species are a little bit less tolerant to uh, the intense fire than the dry oak woodland, but these sites were always subject to the same fire rotation or return interval as the oak woodlands. But the intensity within this site was lower due to the more closed canopy and uh, reduced uh, not not the as well developed uh, herbaceous layer on the ground. Wind, drought, and fire are the primary influence on this system as well. Third type is the uh, uh, the uh, interior highlands, calcareous glades, and barrens. This typically occurs on southerly and westerly aspects. Uh, parent material consists of limestone, dolomite, and shell bedrock, uh, moderately to well-drained soils. Soils are often dry out during the summer and fall and then become saturated during the winter and spring. 
but the wet dry cycle on this side is more uh, severe or exaggerated, I guess you could say, than, than uh, some of the uh, adjacent sites. These are lots of times in the wet time of the year, the wettest side on the area. And um, they are dominated by native grassland species. Um, some, some places where there's a little bit more uh, depth of the soil, there'll be stunted woodlands, uh, primarily dominated by chinkapin oak. Uh, fire is the primary natural influence on the system. And glades, you have to think about this as a matrix of all these habitat types together. The dry mesic uh, woodland is the matrix that supports or supports these other habitat types with the dry oak woodland embedded within it and then the glades, uh, these isolated pockets embedded within the dry oak woodlands. There are 52,637 glades within the Ozark Highlands com, uh, comprising 84, over 84,000 acres. Uh, majority of them are in degraded condition due to fire exclusion, which led to forest densification and uh, overgrazing. This is, I'm sorry. This is a, a drone image of a restored site on Harold E. Alexander. And this is an example of the matrix that I was just describing with the glade um, embedded within the woodland that's, uh, that is also embedded in, into the dry oak, the dry mesic uh, woodland forest. And it's just, we're not pushing these habitats into anything that they don't, are not designed to be. We're letting the the uh, aspect, the uh, um, uh, soils uh, determine, and the species composition determine what this is, and then our management is, uh, that guides our management, and our management is uh, geared towards restore, restoring them to their uh, pre-settlement condition. And this site on Harold E, this is just over, this is not the entire restoration site, this is right at a thousand acres, and um, it started in 2016 and still going on, but uh, in the last five years, we've removed over 800,000 cedar trees uh, out of this unit. And most areas averaged about uh, 900 cedars per acre of various sizes. All right, restoration goals and objectives. Um, our primary goal is to restore these habitats to the pre-settlement fire-influenced conditions, um, restore and expand native plant communities range and prevalence, and provide early successional habitat at the landscape level. And um, like I just said, we're not we're not trying to drive these uh, sites in anything they do not want to be. Um, so. On all of our lands, over 300,000 acres of uh, AGFC owned lands, we have um, broken, divided all these lands into stands uh, based on habitat type. Uh, and they correspond with uh, uh, the uh, 37 uh, terrestrial land classes uh, that are listed within the Arkansas Wildlife Action Plan. So that is our overarching uh, plan that we are using to move our habitats uh, into these desired forest condition. And um, once uh, once uh, we identify at the stand level where these uh, stands, uh, you know, what, what this stand is supposed to be. And from there, we develop habitat management plans uh, that are designed to uh, restore desired conditions uh, within these different habitat types. Um, and this uh, wildlife management area, desired forest conditions or DFCs, this is a guideline that we follow on all of our WMAs, not just this uh, WMA here at Harold E. Alexander. Um, with 40% of each land class meeting desired forest condition criteria at any time. And at the same time, 30% of each land class shifting towards DFCs or growing into desired condition. And 30% of these land classes growing out of DFC or desired forest conditions. And uh, through most of our careers, through all of my career, I've been focusing on moving 
uh, habitats to desired forest conditions. Um, and it will be the habitat biologists that follow me uh, that will decide when it is time to to, to uh, start letting these grow out of desired conditions. And uh, in, the, in these uh, upland habitats where fire is a part of our management, um, these are, especially when we're talking about the post oak dominated uh, uh, woodlands and um, the, the glades, these are these are long lived species. And uh, once we get these in desired conditions, uh, it, it may go on for decades and decades before it is time uh, to start reducing our fire frequency and pulling fire out and start regenerating these stands. Uh, whenever you're looking at the uh, the uh, um, dry mesic uh, um, uh, habitats where it's uh, the uh, red oak, white oak component, these uh, would, would have a uh, um, shorter turnaround period. So once we move these into desired condition, we may not leave them there uh, that many years uh, before we start letting them grow out of, out of that uh, um, desired condition, just that continual uh, uh, cycle of, of keeping these areas productive. Okay, so, um, you know, there's been a uh, very effective uh, um, effort, really going back to the 1940s, to um, uh, discourage uh, use of fire, the fire is bad, and it has been very effective, but what it's resulted in is the, the forest densification that I mentioned earlier uh, within this ecoregion, and, and really all across all of uh, uh, the South. And um, these stands have reached a point that uh, fire alone will not restore them. So that's whenever we have to use the different silvicultural techniques, uh, both commercial and non-commercial techniques to um, to uh, remove the uh, surplus trees and uh, begin the process of restoring it uh, with fire after that. Okay, I mentioned uh, on that uh, on that the slide with the matrix uh, that over 800,000 cedar had been removed from that site. We started with uh, cedar harvest, commercial harvest, with over um, 4,500 tons of cedar, eastern red cedar being uh, harvested from Harold E. Alexander in a five to six year time period. Um, this is uh, this is where we start anywhere that there is a marchable cedar, that there's enough volume to justify a sale. That's where we're, that's where we're going to start. And uh, whenever we're thinking about burning and reducing, you know, residual slash or anything, that's over 4,000 tons of uh, debris that we did not have to uh, deal with trying to consume uh, with fire uh, due to us being able to harvest it. Um, hardwood harvest, um, that is, uh, we implement that where it's uh, feasible as well. Um, this typically does not occur in the dry oak woodlands due to the volume of uh, not being able to support a, a commercial harvest. This is whenever we're looking at these upland sites, it's going to be on the dry mesic sites where uh, it's got the uh, um, more moisture, more fertile site and be able to grow enough volume that would actually support a harvest. And uh, this is often our first uh, um, uh, this is all, often the first uh, uh, restoration management technique we use in, in managing these sites. Okay, reclamation by mulching or mastication. Uh, this, uh, like a lot of our uh, management techniques, everything has its place. Um, this was typically in um, the sites, uh, the transition from the uh, dry oak woodland into the glades and also within the glades where the cedar really uh, over the years was really able to take a stronghold. And, uh, and as I'd mentioned before, you know, we're looking at over 900 stands per acre in places. So there was, uh, this was the most feasible uh, method for reducing those cedars so that we can move forward with the restoration. It's uh, it's quite costly. We don't we don't use that near as often as we do some of the other techniques, but it does have its place. Um, this uh, again was a restoration site on Harold E. Alexander um, with the picture in the uh, top right. 
you can see uh, the uh, the line where the cedar on the right. Uh, that's that was that's gone now, but that's where we I took the picture that day, and the entire area looked just like that. So he was not removing anything but cedar uh, through mastication. And uh, the picture on the bottom right that was uh, that's the same site last uh, Friday, uh, dominated by a little blue stem. Uh, it's starting to get the shrub component in it. Um, just scattered trees, basically a, a grassland uh, with a, a native grassland with a few scattered trees in it. Wildlife stand improvement by injection, by chemical injection and chainsaw are the two most common methods that we use with uh, WSI by injection being uh, uh, cutting the tree with a hatchet or machete around the tire circumference and um, uh, uh, spray herbicide in it that will kill just that tree. Um, this is very effective at targeting uh, uh, by species, by diameters. Uh, it is very low impact and um, the uh, it's you're looking at a longer uh, time period uh, uh, before you can actually start to see your results uh, and in, in meeting their desired conditions than some of the other methods that are like the mulching or the uh, WSI by chainsaw that's immediately putting that tree on the ground. But it, WSI by injection, it does allow us to be able to come back in there and burn sooner and safer than we can with the other methods where we're late putting all the fuel on the ground at one time. Uh, the WSI by chainsaw, uh, that's just cutting the tree. Uh, reducing the, the uh, debris to a specified height, usually 24 to 30 inches above ground level, and spraying the stump on uh, all targeted uh, hardwood species. The strategic implementation of prescribed burning is critical in maintaining and shifting these uh, desired conditions. Um, one thing that we have uh, really worked to, towards over the last several years is starting to uh, um, incorporate growing season burns, fall burns into uh, our uh, burn program. Um, uh, you know, in the early days of the burn program, it was all dormant season burns and, and early spring burns. But what we've learned over the years is um, if if we're if we keep implementing these static uh, burn uh, return intervals, we're selecting for certain species, especially in our herbaceous species, and we're we're hurting others because there are there are many of these native species that will flower and and bloom early in the season, and if we're burning at the same time every year, we're effectively just uh, you know over time just removing them from our uh, um, from the landscape on 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 these WMAs with our burning. So historical burns, they did not occur just in the in the dormant season. There was um, lots of, uh, you know, in the droughtiest, driest periods, that's when these historical burns uh, occurred. And, uh, you know, they covered millions of acres. And at times they were they were stand resetting burns that actually um, reset these stands back and took them down to ground zero and let them start over. So um, we are in our restoration. The initial burns, like you see here on the picture on the left with the mulch, that was a burn that was three days after a rain, and it would not cut uh, the fire would not carry in hardwood leaf litter due to moisture. But the, we had enough wind and enough dry drying in that three days that we was able to burn the mulch, reduce that fuel load and the hazard, and reduce the uh, the uh, uh, potential for damaging our residual trees. And um, once we get a site, once we can get that heavy fuel load. Uh, removed with the initial one or two burns, and then we're going to move more into our management burns, which are going to be the fall burns, some growing season burn where it will carry, and um, in and then into mixing in a burn within the peak dormant season, so that's not just all one season. All right, this is just a photo plot uh, um, from 2016 to. 2020 on Harold E. Alexander, and I apologize for the quality of picture, but top left is a, uh, that is a glade. Um, and you can see there's, it's solid cedar. There's, uh, there was remnant glades uh, within this area. I call them remnant glades. They held on all these years just to the lack of 
soil and uh, the cedar were not ever, ever able to encroach all the way uh, on some of these glades. Um, but the picture on top right, uh, that was after the initial uh, treatment and that line indicates on the right was mastication or mulching on the right. On the left was a, a cut and drop by chainsaw. Bottom left was the burn in 2018. We also burned it again in 2020 and uh, bottom right is 2020 where we have re restored that to desired conditions and we will continue to maintain that uh, with fire. All right, we have had a, uh, um, uh, a positive response uh, to our avian species that utilize these open uh, grasslands uh, 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 habitats and um, Marcus Asher, Quail Program Coordinator, he provided this data uh, based on uh, point counts and uh, the fall covey counts that they that they have uh, performed on the WMA. And uh, as you can see on the left, there has been a uh, um, positive uh, uh, response to species that um, uh, utilize this habitat. And as we are recruiting this more of a shrub component, uh, the species uh, um, uh, diversity is starting to increase as well. Um, the, uh, the two graphs on the right are uh, northern bobolot quail point count uh, uh, data. Uh, from 2017 to 2020, and then uh, the, the bottom right is the covey counts at Harold E. And as you can see from 2017 to 2019, it was, there was just none detected. And since then, uh, we have been able to connect a habitat to remnant coveys that were on private property that we knew were there, and that was our goal, to connect our habitats to these coveys to uh, um, recruit them onto the WMA. And we have seen a, uh, um, a significant increase, uh, especially when we started at zero in 2017. We've also seen a uh, 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 incredible uh, response to uh, native uh, vascular plants on the WMA. And this, uh, according to the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission, this wildlife management area at Harold e. Alexander is the most diverse uh, WMA or natural area in Arkansas. With over, uh, with, with 38 species of concern being documented. Um, now there are there are several uh, S ranked and G ranked species on this WMA, with uh, S ranked species being uh, species that are tracked at the state level, and um, the G ranked species are uh, tracked globally based on data from all the natural heritage programs in the country, and. Um, in direct response to our management, there had been four S1 and S2 species um, uh, documented on Harold E. Alexander. With, and I should also mention S1 being the most, the, the one rating being uh, the most uh, rare or um, uh, vulnerable species. So there are four, four S1 and S2 species documented as a result of management and um, there's also, uh, it's worth mentioning, rigid sedge as uh, an S1 species. This WMA is the only known site in Arkansas. And um, they recently discovered a species that is uh, new to science, and they are currently uh, um, awaiting for it to be named. And I thought that was uh, really cool. All right, key points. Uh, appropriate site selection is critical for this type of restoration. As I said, uh, you cannot push uh, um, a uh, dry oak woodland into a mesic site and expect the same kind of results. Uh, it just will not work. Uh, res this restoration requires aggressive management desired conditions are to be achieved. Um, whenever you have to get outside of your comfort zone because these are drastic uh, changes that we are implementing on, on, these, uh, on these habitats. Prescribed fire is a major influence in maintaining the structure and diverse species composition. And careful planning and implementation of prescribed fire is critical, especially during the initial entry burns. And um, that, is, uh, that is a key point on the initial burns with the heavy fuel loads. Burn, burning under low to moderate uh, uh, burn conditions to, so that you can control your fire intensity 
and uh, it's also important to mimic historical burn uh, periods, alternate dormant growing season burns. And that is all I have. Well, questions? thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, I think we can probably have some questions. I have one just as a, um, it might maybe a silly question, but um, you know, I've written a lot of articles over the years that uh, mention eastern red cedars, and uh, they're never spoken of very highly. Does the, does the eastern red cedar as a species have uh, have a place in the Ozark Highlands? It does, and um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this or not, but during the uh, the GLO, the GLO uh, notes, the General Land Office notes from the early 1800s only documented eight cedar trees in all of those Ozark Highlands. The Central Plateau, what we've been talking about, there was there was not one uh, cedar tree uh, utilized as a bearing tree. And um, um, the cedars historically, with fire on the landscape, were uh, they were restricted to like the White River, the bluff, the bluffs along the White River, where fire intensity would low, be low or cut off. And because uh, cedar is very susceptible to fire, and that's why it was not prevalent on the landscape 200 years ago. There you go. Um, anyone else have a question for Rob? Yeah, is this uh, PowerPoint, is it available that we can download it and say use it at uh, Hunter Ed classes or, or any public meetings we go to and try to share some of this? It can be. I can put it out on the uh, uh, global share. All right. I'd, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Anyone else? Randy Zellers raised his hand. Oh, did he? Uh, yes. Um, when you when you're talking about these thick areas, I mean, do these thick areas have a place? I mean, I know we we do a lot of work, you know, burning and, and clearing out some of these, but do the do some of these thick areas actually have a place? I mean, it, it, for folks not to go willy nilly and just clearing stuff. Well, what what would you think the thick place would be? Would it be bedding cover, nesting cover? Is that what you're Maybe right, like for bedding cover or something like that, does it have a purpose or is there a point where it gets too thick? There is a point that it gets too thick, but if you if you if you look at the uh, just you know the slides I was showing on restored uh, the restored sites, uh, the the grassland, the uh, um, the native grassland, the shrub layer in there, there is uh, um, it's you're not limiting uh, the if it's a turkey uh, hen looking for a place to nest or quail, you're not limiting to these uh, little pockets. Uh, everything out there is available habitat, and it it, it disperses everything. It reduces uh, the uh, predator success, um, and uh, you know there is going to be the thick spots like you're talking about more in the riparian areas where the uh, uh, fire is not going to be have the influence on it that it will in the uh, in the uh, um, higher sites, more drier sites. So I'd say yes, there is a place, and it's going to be more in the riparian areas. Okay. Anyone else? Sounds like that might be it, Rob. <laughs> well, sorry about the trouble with uh, uh, sharing my screen there. Uh, we should spend more time on that Friday, I guess. That's okay. We got there. Um, so if anyone else has anything, now's the time to uh, to jump in. Without that, I think we're uh, I think we're going to wrap up this session. Thanks to everybody for uh, for tuning in, and thanks uh, Rob and Jeremy for the great presentations. Thank thanks, you, guys.